So now I'm going to talk about semi-honest adversaries. And before I get into the numbers and show you the radical difference between 2004 and today, first I want to ask, is it of any interest? Why am I looking at semi-honest secure computation? Because semi-honest adversaries are very weak. So the first thing to know is it protects against inadvertent leakage. So what does that mean? Let's say we have two p hospitals that want to do some computation on sensitive information between them for the purpose of medical research. Then they essentially trust each other, not trying to cheat each other. The problem is that one hospital will say, okay, if you're broke, I don't want to rely on your IT. I don't want to rely on the fact that my data is protected because no one broke into your computers. No, that's not acceptable in terms of my the law and also in terms of my, my security policies. A semi honest protocol is enough to guarantee that nothing will be revealed about hospital one's input in hospital two's service. It's exactly in fact what it says. Another place where it can be uh, uh, considered is where software is not easily or likely replaced in, in an IARPA product, uh, IARPA grant which was related on trying to do really efficient computation, they actually argued that for them semi-honest is enough because they're thinking about a setting where you might have something run between the FBI and CIA and it's, it's installed on, on, on servers that, that essentially the user has no, no way of changing the code that's there, so it's enough for them to have semi-honest security. That's one answer, although in general I would say that no, in general semi-honest security is not enough. If I give the example of the two servers protecting the cryptographic key, semi-honest security is definitely not enough because once an attacker breaks into a computer, chances are they, have, they can run whatever they want and not just have read access. But another reason why we want to study this is because the optimizations that we'll see here actually very much help for malicious adversaries. And in fact, almost all of the, almost all of the optimizations that we have for getting really efficient semi-honest secure computation carry over to getting really efficient uh, secure computation for malicious adversaries. Okay, that's an empirical argument, but that's just the way it is. Okay, so let's go back to 2004. That's a while ago. And the first implementation of a secure protocol was carried out. And it, it was an implementation of Yao's protocol. And at the time, this would be like, you know, implementing a car production to do a zero-knowledge proof or something just absurd. Like, you know, you, you, the, it was something which was... Many people thought that... that you couldn't even implement and run such a thing. Uh, and they actually ran the protocol, and it ran, and, and it was very surprising and very interesting. And, the, and they computed the billionaire's problem, which is, you know, who has more money, right? Who, who has more money on 32-bit integers, and it took between 1.25 seconds and 4 seconds, so that's fast enough for the billionaire's problem. It's uh, uh, as long as you have at most $4 billion, of course. And also, it... Uh, um, uh, but it is a very small computation. Right? We're talking about a very, very small circuit. They also did the median on 10 16-bit numbers, which is a circuit already of size 4,000 gates, and that took between 7 again and 16 seconds, depending if you're running it on LAN or, or a WAN. So this showed that actually it's possible to actually run this thing, you know, to construct these garbled gates and to send them and to compute on them and to get times which for some applications are reasonable. By the way, not everything is real time. I did my masters in data mining many, many years ago. And in, in back then, and probably today as well, data miners are happy for their arguments to run for two days. It's fine. Right? It's, you're running on a huge amount of data, but if it runs for two days, not everything is real time. So you know, there could be applications where definitely waiting 10 seconds or so is fine. But these are very toy examples, right? We're talking about very, very small inputs. So in 2011, there was an implementation of Yao so same setting as Fair Play, semi-honest adversaries. They used the state-of-the-art algorithmic improvements and systems optimizations, and they did AES computation. Now, I'm saying with 9,000 non-XOR gates, you won't know why I'm talking about specifically non-XOR gates and not any gates, but the circuit has 30,000 gates, but there are only 9,000 non-XOR gates. It took 0.2 seconds overall to do the whole computation after initial 0.6 seconds, which is a pre-processing which can be reused many times. So it went down from 7 seconds for 4,000 gates to 0.2 seconds for uh, uh, 9,000 gates, but even actually much, much more because there's actually 30,000 gates in this circuit. Okay, and today we can even do this much, much quicker. Right, this is already old stuff. This is two years old.
No, it's due to a lot of algorithmic optimization. It's the same algorithm, but what I'm going to show you now is all of the algorithmic improvements and protocol improvements that have gone in that made it all possible. All right, if we had just taken exactly fair play and run it today, yes, there's Moore's Law, but you wouldn't get anything close. Another thing which is really interesting is this, the Levenstein distance, which is the edit distance between two strings on inputs of size 2,000 and 10,000. This, this is a circuit with 1.29 billion gates. Right? This is a whopping circuit. And it's surprising we can even do such a thing. I mean, it's not just, okay, how long it takes. But can you actually compute a computation of that size? And they actually did it, and it took, okay, a little under four hours. So it took a long time. But you actually managed to run a computation on 1.29 billion gates. Right? This, is, this is big. So that's 2011. What's happened since then? Well, 2013, I said 2011 was a long time ago. So something which was just posted very, very recently. Uh, so this doesn't relate to the entire YAS protocol, but just to the garbling of the circuit and the computation of the circuit. They can actually garble the entire AES circuit in 637 microseconds. So it's less than one millisecond. And the evaluation can be carried out in a quarter of a millisecond. And the best previous time for garbling, which was two years before, that is 80 milliseconds. Now they use a certain assumption, which you can argue cryptographic assumption, which is not as great. We'll, I'll show it to you later on. But again, you're talking about an improvement in you know, one and a half, two years. This is a protocol improvement, and a, 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 a crypto improvement, that's dropping you down from 80 milliseconds to, to less, than, less than one millisecond. Okay, also using uh, Intel uh, AES chip, but, but that's something which is available. Another work, if you're talking about the Levenstein distance, for example, so in 2011 it took 223 minutes, and in a paper which is about to come out in ACM CCS, we actually did it in 11 minutes. So we can compute uh, um, a 1.29 billion gate circuit in 11 minutes, but not using Yao anymore, using GMW. So the GMW that you need oblivious transfer for every single gate and looks like a lot of interaction, really expensive, we can actually do uh, uh, in 11 minutes down from 222 th 223 minutes. Another example, if you took minimum on 10 million bit inputs, which is a circuit of 40 million gates in 19 seconds. Right, so these are big computations and these are very, very fast. Okay. And by the way, we're not talking about really special hardware or anything like that. These are good computers, but not amazing ones. Okay, so how do we do this? What's the sources of improvements? How can we get to such impressive times? And uh, um, uh, so, so th there, are, there are three or four levels of how you count. One are crypto protocol improvements. So we actually look at the hours protocol, the GMW protocol, or how the oblivious transfer works, or how the gate is constructed, and, and do it in a different way. This is crypto work, it's crypto research. Another is actually general algorithmic research, and I'll give one example of that, which is in the, the, the recent work that, that, sh that, uh, that will appear in ACM CCS this year. Actually, it's applying general algorithms research, and not even crypto research. And that has to do with the fact that what I told you that three or four years ago, the only thing we were interested in optimizing is the number of cryptographic operations. But now the crypto operations are not necessarily even the bottleneck anymore. It can be the communication, the bandwidth. It can be uh, other uh, cash, cash misses. Cash misses can actually account for a large percentage of the time in a, in a, in a crypto protocol, which no one would have thought is, is, would be the case a few years ago. Uh, and there are also systems optimizations and, and memory management that actually have a very, very big effect. So we're understanding that to do crypto secure computation really, really efficiently, yes, you need to improve your protocol, but you also need to take, take into account a lot of other things because they can actually start, we've got to a stage where they're actually slowing you down a lot. Okay, so I'm going to show you five optimizations, and I'm probably not going to get through them all. Uh, but they are point and permute, double encryption optimizations, the freak sort technique, which is incredibly important, garbled row reduction, and oblivious transfer extensions. Okay, now I'll probably stop somewhere in the middle here. You'll know what it is, but understanding in depth that Yuval can explain because it's his result anyway. <coughs> okay, so let's start with a correct decryption in Yao. Now the simple method 
where we have this garbled gate. And within this garbled gate, which is four ciphertexts, I have two keys, and I need to decrypt one of the ciphertexts. But I don't know which one I'm decrypting. So I need a mechanism to tell me if I've decrypted correctly or incorrectly. So the simple way of doing this is to add redundancy, like a whole string of zeros when I encrypt, the, when you construct the garbled gate. And if I'm encrypting with the wrong key, I'm not going to get a whole lot of zeros. So that would really be small probability. Now this has a number of problems. The first problem is I'm making my ciphertext longer, which actually means that I need more applications of my encryption function on my block cipher. That's one problem. Another problem is it means that I have to try and decrypt every single row. So on average, because they're randomly permuted, it's two and a half decryptions. Why two and a half? It's an average of one to four, which is one, one through four, one plus two plus three plus four, which is ten. So on average, I'm actually doing two and a half decryptions per gate. So the encryptor, the, the, the party who's constructing the garbled circuit is doing four encryptions per gate, or actually it depends, it's actually eight encryptions, because each one is a double encryption. And the guy receiving is doing two and a half times, it's five encryptions. So it's a lot of encryptions, we'd like to reduce that. Okay, so this, the method, there's a method called point and permute, um, which is to, to give the information about which ciphertext you're supposed to be decrypting within the, uh, uh, within the, within, with, within the uh, uh, previous, uh, for, to be given from the previous gate. So when you got a key from the previous gate, it will tell you, it will give you a bit of information which will help you to know which ciphertext to decrypt. Specifically, you choose a random, we call random signal bit for each wire. So not only do I choose now a zero key and a one key, I also choo choose a random signal bit. And the intuition is that if the signal bit equals zero, then it means keep the, keys in the, keep the keys in the right order, and if it's a one, then flip the order. Essentially meaning within the ciphertext. I'll show you two in a second. So the correct order of the ciphertext is this, right? If you're not permuting. If you're not permuting, then in terms of the order of the truth table, that's the way it looks. Now, if I chose two signal bits, I chose them at random. If they both happen to be zero, then I leave it in the same order. If the first one is one and the second one is zero, then I interchange the first two with the last two. So I just flip these, I just take these two and put them here, and I, I reverse the order. If the first bit is zero and the last one is one, then I flip inside here, because I flip the order between these two. Instead of being zero, one, zero, one, it's one, zero, one, zero. And if they're both one, then I flip everything. So I get all possible permutations of the ciphertext, and the signal bit tells me what permutation to use. Right, so that's the general one. And then, I don't want to go into all this, but let's just, even if it looks too, too, too scary to even leave on the slide, I'll leave it there, but don't bother reading. What basically happens is that I, I can give you now these signal bits, which are just random bits. I actually give you the, the XOR between the signal bit and the key bit, and, and the actual bit which is supposed to be, and you don't know anything about it because it's an XOR between the correct value and a random bit. But it tells, but straight away the two bits that I'm getting from the input wires will point exactly to the ciphertext that you have to decrypt. So this small, small little idea, which is a very, very nice idea, uh, which goes back, I believe, to Moni, Benny, and Ruben Sabner's paper about auctions uh, many years ago, this very, very simple idea has now decreased the time of evaluating the garbled circuit by a factor of, of from two and a half uh, encryptions or five encryptions to, to, on average, to two. So or two and a half attempts to, to a single attempt. So that's uh, what, uh, just over a third, 44, whatever. One divided by one, two and a half. So this, this is a 40%, uh, a right? So reduced it to 40% of the cost. This is a very simple idea. And I'm gonna, these are the sort of things that, that, that in the long run are going to make a huge difference. Because I've just given you one tiny idea, and I've reduced the time of evaluating the circuit by f to 40% to of what it was before. It's a 60% reduction. Yeah? Aren't you spending most of the time on business transfers? No, no. We'll see, in the, we'll see later on why not. But you, even at this stage, I can tell you that if you think about, let's say you think about an, an AES uh, uh, circuit. So it's uh, 30,000 gates, 128 bit input. So you're doing 128 business transfers. These oblivious transfers can take you nowadays uh, 
if you do them even naively, uh, an exponentiation, if you're using a, a good library for elliptic curve cryptography, will be half a millisecond. Sure, but if the circuit were different, So if you have a circuit with a massive amount of inputs and a small number of things, then that would be more expensive. But towards the end of this hour, I'll show that actually we can do oblivious transfers also at the cost of symmet a symmetric operation. So that's also a massive, massive thing which has a, which is which is significantly improved the efficiency of things. Yes. Uh, doesn't understand if, uh, if you're using the signal beats, doesn't it imply that there is sort of a leakage if you if, if the same values uh, are are used in in parallel in, along a certain uh, line? Uh, so I have to remember it's possible if you're going to no, I don't think it does. It does. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. You're using the fine. same value again. Yeah, but it's the uh, 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 if you have the sort of without and without. So then maybe you have to have a different signal bit, oh, a different wire. If, I, if I'm coming out of the gate and I have uh, two wires, then maybe I'll have two different signal bits for that, I think. So if I have a single wire, which splits into more, into another one, I, I may have to have a different single, a signal bit, I, I don't remember. The, we could look at the details. So they may need a different bit for each wire. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing I said is that the, the second problem or, or an obvious uh, point of uh, uh, of waste is that we need two encryptions per ciphertext in the because uh, uh, we have to encrypt under two keys. So we'd like to save that as well. Okay, so the standard way of doing it is, for example, to do use AES and to double encrypt each time. Okay, this is already going to be a problem, by the way, because notice that in AES the input size, the block size, and the key size is the same if you're using 128 bit AES. But I have to add a sig signal bit in his here as well. So actually, I'm going to be having 129 bits of input. So I have to somehow work that out as well. It actually gets messy. So an alternative that we proposed four years ago or so was to do the following. Instead of encrypting using AES and double encrypting that way, hash the two keys that you have together and XOR the result with the... Uh, um, with the... Uh, the, with the output key. Okay, I, obviously under the RAN Oracle assumption this is fine, but also a correlation robust type assumption on hash functions is a pretty pretty reasonable assumption. The security of hash functions as a type of pseudorandom generator with some sort of correlation robustness is, is sufficient for proving this secure. Uh, intuitively, because of the way a hash function works, if you don't if if I have these two keys, I can get this obviously, but I won't be able to get anything here. Okay, and again, I have the signal bits. I'm leaving out the signal bits just to, to make too much noise in the slides. The signal bit which tell me, tell me which one. And now instead of doing two AES operations, I'm doing one hash function operation. Good idea or not a good idea? What do you think? Actually, SHA-1 is much, much slower than AES. <laughs> uh, the advantage though here is I don't have a problem with the lengths. With the AES, I also have a length problem. But actually, this is not necessarily a good idea. Like everyone... The, the concept that hash functions are much faster than encryption functions was true in the days of triple days. It's not really true anymore. AES is in fact faster than, than, than SHA-1 and possibly, I'm not sure if two AESs are faster than SHA-1, but it's, it's a close call. It's a close call. Um, what we'd like to actually really use is AES with a fixed key, because if we use AES with a fixed key, then we can use the, a, the Intel instruction, the Intel uh, uh, AES chip. Why do we want a fixed key? Because if I'm using a new key every time, then just loading that key into the instruction set and expanding out the key will take, uh, take up more time than, than, than it's worth. But if I could use a fixed key the whole way through, then I'll load it once in, and this chip gives amazing speeds. Right? So that's, so what, so Bellare and uh, three others at Al defined a double encryption in this funny way. I'm not going to go into what the justification is for it, but essentially it says that if I take a fixed key K and I assume that AES of the fixed key K behaves like a random permutation, this is like a type of random oracle assumption, but it's different. If I assume that, then this thing will actually be a secure double encryption. Why I have the two and the four here, it's actually due to other reasons. But there, there are a number of number constructions in the paper, I don't want to go into the details, I just want to show you that I now have a single AES operation with a fixed key, allowing me to use the uh, Intel instruction set, 
and I can get double encryption and it's secure, and that's the way I, like, uh, that's the way I, like, way I, way I will encrypt in general. And that's the way they get to 600 and so microseconds to construct an entire garbled circuit on, on 10,000 gates and only 240 or so microseconds to evaluate the circuit. So by here is a sort of a systems together with crypto research because exactly defining this in a proper way and making an appropriate assumption on this. So the assumption, the cryptographic assumption is somewhat harder. I'm not just talking about AES as a standard encryption scheme but also behaving as like a random permutation. But if you accept that assumption about the AES function, then what you actually get is uh, something which is uh, a really a combination of systems optimizations given uh, hardware that is now common on, on all new machines. Uh, and you can actually get, get incredibly fast speeds. Right? So we can do AES in, in, in milliseconds, really, a few milliseconds. Okay. Let's now go to something which is, uh, uh, traces back five years or so, which is a really huge breakthrough in, uh, in getting a making Yao efficient. And the thing to notice is most circuits or many circuits are planned with NOT AND and XOR gates. Okay? NOT essentially is the same as XOR gate. Right? If you can just have a, a fixed one value and use that to XOR it in. And they're often, not necessarily, but they're often more XOR gates than AND gates. Because if you look at the AES function, I managed to get a cold in the middle of summer for some reason. <laughs> should have turned off the microphone before I did that. Uh, so, if you look at AES, it has 6,800 AND gates and 25,000 XOR gates. Right, so, this number 6,800, it depends at the time I was talking about 8,000, 9,000. As time has gone on, and this is another, I'll mention it again at the end, but another part of the reason why we can do things much more efficiently is because also the compilation technique to get the, the Boolean circuit we want has improved. So, if there are, any, are there any electrical engineers in the house? No one? So actually, a really interesting uh, line of research, in my opinion, is to come up with circuit optimizers that will say, I don't care how many XOR gates there are. Give me lots of them, because I'm going to show you they're going to be for free in a moment. Just make sure the number of AND gates is, is small. This is a problem that engineers have never, you know, hasn't been interesting to them, but for us it's really, really interesting. So it's actually, we started off with uh, AES having 30,000 gates, and then we we got it down to, to 12,000, 8,000, now 6,800 AND gates. So if I could do the XOR gates for free and only pay for the AND gates, I'd only have to do my double encryption 6,800 times, not 30,000 times, which is a huge difference. Theirs actually is not so friendly, right? Uh, and the multiplier, it's somewhat, we're saving still 20% uh, or so. Okay? Actually, we're saving more because the NOT gates we have to count as well. Right, so even there is actually we're saving the NOT gates as well, so we're still saving 12,000 or so gates. So it's actually 40% or so. Okay, so in Yao's protocol, what are we paying? Oh, five encryptions per gate because we have four for the uh, constructor and one for the, for the evaluator. And we have to also transmit four ciphertexts per gate. So it's not just the computation. If I have to transmit four ciphertexts for 30,000 gates or four ciphertexts for 7,000 gates, that's a massive difference, right, in terms of my, my bandwidth. So this is a big thing. Okay, so how, how does this work? So Kolesnikov and, and Schneider proposed to choose a global random value R. And instead of setting each, the two, remember for every Y I'm choosing two keys, right? I'm choosing a zero key and a one key at random. And they propose instead of choosing two random uncorrelated keys, Choose all the zero keys at random and make all the one keys be the zero key XOR the fixed value R. Now note that in Yao's protocol, you only ever get to see one key on each wire. So fact, the fact is that the, this value R will never be revealed because you're only getting one key on every wire. So, so I'm able to do this. So let's say so we, so we're going to compute them in this way. Right, so WI0 is chosen randomly, WI1 will be this. And what happens if I have, so I start at the bottom and I start computing the wires, uh, the, the values on the wires, and when I get to an XOR gate, I choose the value on the output wire of that gate simply to be the XOR of the values on the input wire. I don't use any, 
encryptions at all. I don't use any table. I can compute the output wire as a direct function of the input wires. So let's see why that works. So I have, an, I have an XOR gate, and I have input wires I and J and output wire K, and we said that we're going to compute WK to simply be WI XOR WJ, right? which is our, or essentially our zero values. Now, so we have WI is WI alpha, WJ is WJ beta, so if alpha and beta are both zero, then what that means is that the result I'm taking is WI zero, XOR WJ zero, but we chose WK zero to be that value, so I actually got a zero. That's fine. What happens if both of them are ones? Then I have WK, I'm taking WK to the XOR of those two, right? Because I'm XORing the one values. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm, I, I'm not aware of what I'm doing, but this is mathematically what's happening. But this is W0 XOR R, and that's W0 XOR R, so the R's cancel out and I get back the zero value. So when XOR the two one values, the R cancels out and I get the zero value. And if I have a zero and a one, then the R stays inside, so I get a one value. So it all works really, really uh, nicely, and not only do I not have to encrypt anything, I don't have to transmit anything, and so now my 30,000 gate circuit has been reduced to a 7,000 gate circuit, and my encryption time is only going to be taken for the uh, uh, AND gates and not for the XOR gates. Now this is really, really nice stuff. So for example, uh, uh, a non-XOR gate, you'll just do the regular way. Okay? Now, when you want to do optimizations, all the optimizations which came afterwards all you know, have to make sure that they're compatible with this. So the, the reason why there's that 2 and that 4 and that, double in, that funny double encryption using the AES-NI instruction set is exactly to make it compatible with the free XOR. And you have to prove that you're still doing that because it, it's actually non-trivial. So actually the free XOR proving its security, you need to make some assumption about the, the hash function h, but if it's a random oracle, for example, and you do the sort of encryption I said there, it's fine. Or if you also do, uh, um, do what I showed you with the ASNI, then, then it's also fine. But you have to make sure you do it correctly. Okay, so so far we've seen point and permute, we've reduced the number of, double, the number of encryptions, we've reduced the number of gates. And just a note here also, I'm not going to go into uh, exactly why, but um, the, uh, uh, the, per the point and permute is also compatible with the freak source. Okay, so everything works together so far. Okay, so, so we started off with a massive circuit with many, many encryptions. We've now re essentially reduced the circuit size down. We only now have to send ciphertexts for the number of non-XOR gates, and obviously not the same as XOR we said, so only for the number of AND gates. We only have to encrypt for the number of the gates. The value only has to do a single encryption, right? That's the point of view. And also, it doesn't have to do double encryption each time, but we can just do... AES with a fixed key or, or say a single hash function operation or something to that effect. Okay, so this is, this is looking up. Now we can start seeing why we have these massive improvements uh, over the last five years because these each, each one of those things is actually uh, in percentages, percentage wise is a massive, massive percentage improvement. Right, so we're really going down quickly. But now we've sort of get, we've become much more efficient and bandwidth is becoming a real issue. Right, so the more the better we make the cryptography, our problems start popping up in different places. Actually, we've seen this a lot of times with, especially with the malicious protocols that I'll show you in the next hour. We sort of, this was the bottleneck, so now we construct a new protocol that actually bypasses that bottleneck, and now something else becomes the bottleneck. Obviously, we're going down all the time. We actually have space, place to improve, because every time we improve, we have something else which is heavy that we can continue to improve, and that's why we've had such, uh, such uh, uh, so many improvements. So now I'm going to show you a technique called the garbled row reduction technique, which will say that instead of sending four ciphertexts for a garbled gate, you can send just three. And one will be implicit. Right? That's also 25% reduction in bandwidth is, is significant. And actually the idea is to choose one input pair and make the output correlated with that input be a deterministic function of the input. You don't actually have to encrypt anything. It's sort of like it'll come directly. So let, let's, let's show, show you what I mean. So, okay, here I included the, uh, uh, the signal bit. Just ignore it. What I'm going to do is I, now, I need to compute the... Uh, oh, this is written in a way to really confuse you. So don't look at that. Just listen to me. Uh, I, I have, I'm choosing the, the random keys on, on the input wires. So I have... WI0 and I have WJ0. Instead of choosing WK0 at random, 
like I did before, I'm going to set WK0 to be the hash of WI0 and WJ0. Just to be the hash. And then I'm going to uh, uh, choose obviously WK1 to be, according to the freak sort technique, just, just XOR with a global value. Now obviously if I did that, that would be really bad. Why? Because then you would know that it's the zero value if that's the one you're looking for. So I do it with the, with the signal bits. The signal bits will tell me if both signal bits are zero, then the key that you need is not in any ciphertext. Just hash the two values that you got and take that. That's the key that you need. Otherwise, decrypt. Okay, so one of the values I'm going to take by just saying, ah, that's a direct pro function of the two input keys. There's no ciphertext to help you. Just take the hash of that value and work. Otherwise, decrypt. Now we can actually utilize this sort of concept in many other places because we're essentially just working with random values. So, the, so it's sort of like a de-randomization sort of thing, right? Like, do we need everything to be really uncorrelated and random? Or can we actually have a lot of correlations inside, but as long as they're hidden, security is preserved. So as long as we can prove security, we're allowed to have hidden correlations. And this is another hidden correlation that enables us to only define three ciphertexts and not four. Okay, so if you've got the signal bits pointing to that one, then just hash the two keys and take that as the, the output. Otherwise, decrypt appropriately. Okay? By the way, the details, I don't think the details of exactly how each optimization works are what's important. What's important is to get the idea of what sort of optimizations we have, we have how they sort of work, and, and, and what, what effect that we're getting. So we now just got a 25% uh, reduction. So, so far, notice all the optimizations I showed you are not 2% or 3% improvements, right? They're 25%, 40%, 60%. Uh, these, these are massive, massive improvements. And just to note, the garbled row reduction actually works together with a freak sort. So, all of these things, again, work together. You can prove them together. You have to be very, very careful. It's subtle, but it can be done. Okay, now we get the last one, which is, which is, uh, uh, um, the most difficult, but also really the most amazing. So one of the problems, as, as you pointed out beforehand, is the oblivious transfers. And especially if I want to talk about GMW, because so far I've only been talking about optimizations to Yao, because nobody would bother to use GMW, because you need an oblivious transfer for every single gate. So 30,000 oblivious transfers is going to be, or sorry, you don't need it for the XOR gates, only for the AND gates, 7,000 oblivious transfers, even if each oblivious transfer costs me, say, two it actually costs, uh, say, four exponentiations each party. And each exponentiation only costs me half a millisecond. It's two milliseconds per gate. Two milliseconds per gate, if it's 6,000 gates, is going to be 12 seconds. We're talking about doing an entire, opera uh, entire AES in, in, in a few milliseconds, in five, ten milliseconds. Not in, uh, uh, not in two seconds. So, so GMW is sort of not an option currently. Also with Yao, as, you, as, as was pointed out beforehand, if I have a large input, then I have to run an OT, oblivious transfer, for every single input, that's going to be really expensive. Right? If I have set intersection, and I have a lot of values, then that's going to kill me already, and, and even if I can make all the, the, the optimizations on the, on the gates, I'm already dead. It doesn't really matter. Sort of, you know, if something is really, really slow, it doesn't... If your car accelerates from zero to 100 really, really slowly, but then afterwards it goes really fast, it's not going to help you in a short race. And we're talking about short races here. Okay, so, so oblivious transfer extension, again, is a purely theoretical concept, which was uh, uh, discovered by Beaver in, in a really amazing paper. And he asked the following question. He said, well, yeah, so exponentiations, asymmetric operations are expensive. Is it possible to do many, many oblivious transfers while doing only uh, a fixed number of initial real oblivious transfers. So I'm going to do 128 real oblivious transfers, and then using symmetric operations, I'm going to get the effect of 10,000, or a million, or 100 million. And he showed in a theoretical result, because it it's not concretely efficient, so you would, couldn't, wouldn't actually uh, uh, efficiently implement it, uh, he showed that it can be done. And then Yuval and a few others came on in 2000 and... Uh, Yuval, what year? It's 2003, and showed you actually do this really, really, really efficiently. But I think the impact of that work only really came out in the last few years, um, because before everything else was efficient, it was sort of okay. So even if I could use that, but but nothing else is efficient, so 
that doesn't matter as well. But this is sort of, as I said, you sort of shift the, the, the bottleneck. When, when the circuit was so expensive anyway, you didn't really care that you could do the OTs. I mean, not that you didn't care as a, as a nice crypto result. You didn't care in terms of practical secure computation. But now that I've sort of reduced the cost of everything else, we suddenly realize, but what about the OTs? That's a problem. And we looked back and we said, once again, in 2003, there was this great paper. Maybe we can actually do this efficiently. And, and that's really the case. And, and they showed that you can do something where essentially you do 128 real OTs and you can get a million oblivious transfers afterwards. This is for the semi-honest case. At the cost of a single hash operation per oblivious transfer or a single on the receiver side, two on the sender side. So instead of now having to do a whole lot of, uh, um, a whole lot of exponentiations and asymmetric operations, I can do only 128 and then get a million oblivious transfers, each at the cost of almost nothing, single hash operation. So that's when I said the, uh, uh, the AES uh, circuit that was 0.2 seconds, but 0.6 seconds of of pre-processing, that 0 0.6 seconds of pre-processing was the uh, oblivious, the OT extension, the, the running the base, the base, the initial oblivious transfers, and then using Uval's protocol later on, and then you could get things to be done really, really, really quickly. So it's, it's, it's not useful in a setting where you have this sort of ad hoc uh, computation between two parties who never knew each other beforehand. Uh, it can be useful if you have large inputs, but if you have small inputs, if it's a constant secure computation between two parties, which is uh, makes sense in a lot of the, most applications that we're seeing today, then you can do this ahead of time in a pre-processing stage and then afterwards you can just do many, many, many oblivious transfers essentially for free. Okay? But that protocol also needs some improvements so we'll talk about that now as well. So how does it work? Uh, I'm sure I'm going to confuse you but I'll try not to confuse you too much. I want to give you the, the idea of, of what's going on even more idea of why it's correct because I want to show you something which I found really surprising as one optimization that improved this protocol where by 30%, which I don't think anybody would have predicted that's the case. Okay, so that's, but I want to try and give you an idea as well. So the sender has M pairs. M is a million, or 10 million, or even a billion. Why a billion? Because we want to do the Levenstein distance. We want to do a circuit of 1.29 billion gates. We want to use GMW, but GMW has an oblivious transfer per gate. But that's fine, because now we're going to use Uval's protocol. So now we want, we have 1.29 billion inputs for the sender because he needs an oblivious transfer for every single gate. Okay, so we're going to we start with 128 real oblivious transfers and end up with 1.29 billion. Okay, we're actually going to do that. And the receiver has 1.29 billion choice bits. Right, he's choosing a bit each time. It's even more because this is 1 out of 4, not 1 out of 2, but, but forget it. Okay, so the sender is going to choose a single random string the length of uh, uh, the security parameter, which will be the initial number of oblivious transfers, 128 bits. And the receiver is going to choose n random strings, each one of length 1.29 billion. And then they're going to reverse the roles, and the receiver is going to play the sender. And in each oblivious transfer, the sender is going to input either the random string it chose, TI, or TI XOR all of its choice bits. Right, both of these are of length 1.29 billion. And the receiver is, uh, um, and the, sorry, and the, yeah, and the sender who's playing the receiver will get one of those, either TI or TIX or sigma. Now note that TI is random, so whatever the sender gets, it, it gets something which looks random to it. It doesn't learn anything because it's either TI, which is random, or TIX or CI, uh, sigma I, which is random. So, sigma, so, so it's not learning anything. Now the, let's look at, call the output of S QI. So it's now got these, these strings, Q1, Q2, Q3, through to Q128. So we've got 128 strings, each one very, very, very long. Okay? By the way, if you start to think practically, one thing you have to think of, one second. So we're actually doing oblivious transfers on massive strings, and these are going to be sent, and I'm going to have to hold in memory a massive matrix. What I have now is a massive matrix, which is 1.29 billion on 128. This is a massive thing to hold in memory. This is not going to be a good idea. Okay, so we're going to improve that. But this is something which it, this can be easily be improved. But, but the, this, the naive way of doing it is holding this massive matrix. But let's there. So, so they have this matrix. So uh, we have the Q matrix, which is what the sender received. So it's Q1 through Qn. We're going to write these strings in columns. So now we have uh, 1.29 billion 
uh, long columns and 128 on the rows. Uh, so we have a billion, let's forget the 1.29, just a billion. We have a billion rows now and, uh, uh, um, oh sorry, we have 128, yes, we have a billion rows, 128 columns. Okay, and likewise, we're going to put write T, we had these uh, uh, long, long strings, we're going to write them also in the columns of the matrix. So again, that we, we have these two uh, uh, matrices, which are 1 billion rows now over 128 columns. And then S is going to send, is going to mask the XI0 value, which is its input, its zero input to the, to the oblivious transfer, by XORing it with the hash of the ith column of Q, and the one value it will mask using the hash of the ith column of Q XORed with S. S, that secret value that it got. And R will just output what it got there, XOR its ith column. This makes no sense whatsoever. And even after I've read this protocol 100 times, to me it makes no sense whatsoever. So let's look why in the next slide it makes some sort of sense. So this S is this, this is real magic. I don't know how they come up with this. I really have no idea. So S is 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, it's so 1 billion, so I'm not going to read all the bits to you. So now we have this matrix where we have T1 XOR uh, 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 sigma, T2, T3, T4 XOR sigma, T5 XOR sigma. Why is that the case? Because we said that if S is 1, then what the sender got was that, and if S is, if the bit is 0, it got just the original column. So that's what it received in the previous transfers. And then, note that if sigma 1 is 0, then the first row of Q is the first row of T, because these sigma things make no difference. So that means that when the receiver decrypts by just XORing it with TI, T with the ith column, or well, the ith row, it gets the correct value. Because if the bit is zero, then actually across the entire row, it's exactly just the T values. If sigma i is one, if sigma one is one, then the first row is actually complemented in every place that S1 equals one. Because that's what you, because when S1 equals one, then it got this. But if S1 equals zero, then it's the same as the original value. But if you state that differently, that means that if S1 equals one, I got the complement, and if S1 equals zero, I got, or if, and if S2 equals zero, I got the correct value, that means it's exactly just XORed with S, which is exactly what is masked in here. If you didn't follow, don't worry, just read Yuval's paper, spend three, four hours and you'll understand it. But essentially what I want you to notice, and this is where, what I want to stress, and you'll see why in a moment, this is matrix transposition. What they're essentially doing is we have 128 strings of a billion each, and I'm writing them in columns and I'm reading off on rows. Okay, fine. That's all I'm doing and that's the way the protocol works. And obviously the most expensive thing is the hash function operations, right? Oh, that's a security, but I want to ignore that. Uh, oh, before I get into the matter, I'll come back to the matrix transposition in a minute. Okay, so what the cost of this is just these 128 initial oblivious transfers. And then after there's a few hash function operations for, all, for every oblivious transfer. Right? So this is really, 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 really efficient. And if you want to do millions of oblivious transfers, this is very, very significant. However, there are a number of problems with this protocol, or not problems, but difficulties that arise. One difficulty that arises is, as I said, I have to hold a billion, I have to hold 128 strings, each one of a billion the size of length 1 billion in, in RAM, that's a lot of memory to hold. But it's actually not difficult, and I'm not going to go into this how we do it, it's not difficult to actually do this one block at a time. So you can actually do this by sending, by setting up the initial oblivious transfers in a special way, so that afterwards you do oblivious transfers on, essentially on keys to generate pseudorandom strings, and then you can just send a block at a time, 128 by 128 each time. And, and another advantage of that, that I don't know if you, it's a bit subtle, so if you notice, but if you look at the original protocol, it's sort of, you fix ahead of time the size of the matrix. But if I want to use this for Yao, so eventually what it means, I want to do 128 OTs, and then afterwards, every time I do a computation, I just want to use extension. So that means I actually don't want necessarily a, a bound, an upper bound, a fixed upper bound. Every now and then I'll start from again, like you rekey, but I want a specific upper bound, and, and you can actually solve that problem as well. The second thing is, it turns out, when this was implemented, and this was work that, that Thomas Schneider did, he, they implemented, and they found that 30% of the time of the algorithm went on matrix transposition. Anybody know why? Probably says it here. 
because the cash misses. Matrix transposition is really, really bad for, it's really cash inefficient. Because you have these long strings and every time you want to read a bit, you read the entire string in, you wipe the entire cache, then you read the next bit and you have to read another string in. So it wasn't the hash function which was so important. Like, where do you look to improve oblivious transfer extension? You say, well, your Vile's protocol can't be improved. I mean, we're not going to get less than one hash function operation per oblivious transfer on the receiver side and two for the sender side. Right? It's impossible. You're right. But it turns out that 30% of the cost wasn't even in the hash function. It wasn't in the crypto. It was on cash misses. So by using Eklund's algorithm, which is an algorithm going back 30 or 40 years even, which was written for doing matrix transposition from disk, because then it, you know, the, 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 read, the, the read time from disk is expensive, so you don't want to read so much. So he had a way of doing it. You'd read in sector at a time. You need to be able to do things locally. So that algorithm saves 30% of the time, just, just that by itself. It's a speed up of 30%. It's also possible to reduce the bandwidth, not have actually s the, the receiver send two strings, but you can actually send one and implicitly define the other one. Like in Yao, where we said that you can actually have some correlation and define one and the other, you can do a similar things here. And you can also use parallelizability. And if you do all of those things, then you end up getting that we can do 10 million oblivious transfers on 80-bit strings in two seconds on the LAN and 14 seconds over Wi-Fi. 10 million oblivious transfers. So if you need to do 120 oblivious transfers for, uh, uh, for uh, Yao, that's costing you nothing. If you need to do a few thousand, it's costing you nothing. It's 10 million for two seconds, 2.6 seconds. Right? So that's uh, 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 another example, you know, how we get these, these really impressive... Uh, this, this is a really nice example. Um, I'm on this paper, but I did list the list of the work, so I can praise it. It's not really my work. I'm just there. Uh, but the, you know, the, a lot of these these improvements are really uh, um, impressive improvements, but not necessarily coming from a pure crypto angle. Some of them are, and 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 analyzing the security, improving security, which is which is what I did a lot on here, is improving the security of these optimizations. Is that you have to do that because small optimizations, small changes, or anything crypto can make it insecure. But the ideas that are used are, are really uh, uh, a lot which are coming from the more systems world, more algorithms world, and less from the crypto world, and, and yet we're getting incredible speed ups. And also the nice thing about this is you're no longer bound. We don't care. I, don't, I can do a billion. I can do 100 billion. Uh, there's no memory, there's no me memory problems because you can work on small chunks at a time. Okay, there are other important optimizations in, in, in crypt, uptime in crypto. There's a, 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 another, a different, a different line of uh, research on how to improve uh, Yuval's protocol and extensions by Kolesnikov and Kumarizan, and they uh, uh, have actually asymptotically impressive improvements to the, the protocol. Uh, it would be interesting to try and combine those two together to do the sort of uh, optimizations that they're very, very different types of optimizations. There are circuit optimizations that I talked about. We want to get the circuits to have few non XOR gates. And there are also issues of pipeline executions and better memory management. Just to give you an example, it's sort of like obvious after you say it, but it's only after you say it. So how does Yao's protocol work? One party builds this massive circuit, encrypts all the gates, sends it to the other party and just sits and sort of twiddles its thumb. But while the first party is building this massive circuit, the second party is sitting there twiddling his thumb. Then the second party gets the circuit and now computes this massive circuit and there's a whole lot of time which is being wasted. Not only is there a whole lot of time being wasted, you're transmitting a massive message and you have to hold this whole thing in memory. So you're getting memory problems, you're getting bandwidth problems, and you're getting a lot of waste of time. Well, there's a very simple solution after you think about it. Let's send portions. We'll build a small, we'll, we'll divide our circuit into parts and we'll send it in portions. And then what you essentially do is you do the oblivious transfers and you start sending the, the circuit piece by piece and while the first party is com constructing the next piece of the circuit, the first party is evaluating, the, the, is evaluating that, uh, that piece. And actually things balance out a lot because what you have is that the first party has to work longer, but the other party is waiting for work longer because he has to do four encryptions, not one encryption. But the other party has to wait for the, the communication and things actually balance out very, very nicely. And you get incredible speed ups. And again, it doesn't matter how big the circuit is. So how did they, in 2011, do this 1.29 billion gate circuit for Yao? Simply by cutting to small pieces. If you tried to send that in one block, you, you, you'd blow up. You, you wouldn't be able to do it. So, so that's also just a very small thing, but, but very, very important. Okay, so to sum up, 
Uh, optimizations for, the, for semi honest secure imputation are on multiple levels, on a protocol level, like the improvements to OT extensions, uh, and the freak sword. They're on a primitives level. So we have this double encryption, so sort of a crypto primitive improvement to do double encryption more efficiently. The algorithmic level, like cache efficient matrix transpose. The systems level, which is better memory management, for example. And all of those things put together bring us to a situation where we can do really big computations or, or interesting computations like AES in very, very, in real time essentially, really can be used for, for real time applications. Of course, that's for semi honest adversaries we're still talking here. Uh, but notice that most of these things, if we find a way to translate Yao into uh, um, maliciously be, be secure against malicious adversaries, then all of these ways that we had to make the Yao circuit smaller and easier to compute and the garbage row reduction, all these things to reduce bandwidth, all of those things will carry over to the malicious world. So in the next hour after we come back from the break, I'll show how to make Yao secure against malicious adversaries, but I already am taking Yao, this optimized, highly optimized Yao with the smaller circuits, less computations, and that will be my starting point, which is, which is a much, much better situation. So, thank you.